I will speak first uh, to one of the witnesses. Uh, specifically, she went on uh, CNN, I believe it was, and did an interview and uh, detailed uh, some of the threats that she was receiving, right. uh, you know, um, to her and uh, while she was while she was at the trial and some of the issues she had, and I I can't remember exactly uh, what those threats were, but certainly. Uh, myself and my team uh, faced a lot of uh, threats, and uh, I won't go into the specifics of them, but they were certainly many investigated. Uh, but you know, certainly threats were done in this day and age. You know, threats can be done in in real time. You know, over email or or through social media. So it was um, certainly uh, part of the trial experience. Absolutely. Now, I want to play you something that was uh, played in open trial where there was an accusation of misconduct on the part of Mr. Martinez. Here's a little clip of that, and then we'll get your take on the other Say, side. Posing with uh, a woman who poses on HLN as one of Dr. Drew's jurors. I believe her name is Miss Wick. There has been video. Uh, online of Mr. Martinez outside the courtroom, um, signing autographs and posing for pictures. Uh, I do not have that video to provide the court today. I will do so next week. That was found in the Arizona Republic. Um, I believe that this misconduct uh, may very well have been seen by jurors. I didn't have any evidence to that effect until last night when Ms. Casares, working for HLN, went on and said that she observed a juror seeing Mr. Martinez's fan club and whatever you want to call it. In that regard, I'm asking this court, because she is present in the courtroom today, that Ms. Cazares be called forward to give testimony as to what she observed and which juror she saw watching these events. Mr. Martinez? What happens outside the courtroom is not misconduct. Uh, defense counsel may not like the fact that people have come up to prosecutor and asked him whatever it is that they asked him and whether or not they wanted to have a photograph with him. That is not misconduct. Uh, if defense counsel believes that there was a juror that was there that saw it, even if that were the case, that still would not be prosecutorial misconduct because this happened outside. The remedy in this case is to identify the juror, whoever that may be, to see if in fact that is true because as we know, sometimes facts not quite what they seem or are the way they are reported. And uh, once we ascertain what that is not what that issue is, the course is to then ask the jury whether or not they actually saw it. Uh, uh, Kurt Nermy, there has been a lot of speculation, and I had legal analysts talk about Mr. Martinez and how it's proper and how uh, out of bounds it was for him to be taking snapping photos and uh, pictures. And uh, uh, what was your uh, th uh, theory? To, what were you basically uh, saying in that uh, open court there uh, in terms of his misconduct that you believed at that particular time? Well, th this is another one of those situations where the ethical rules bind me. I've got to be real careful. We're not kind of allowed to make extrajudicial statements about the conduct of other attorneys. But right. uh, I will say that I, I stand by uh, every word I said in uh, in the clip you played. Interesting, interesting. Now, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but before Jody Arias, you were a, a practicing attorney. Um, when do, What year did you start? What school did you go to? And were there any cases that you are proud of that you could speak of? Well, sure, Jordan. I guess I should begin answering your question by uh, thanking you for acknowledging the fact that uh, I actually was an attorney before. <laughs> uh, yes, before you were. Before Jordi Arias was, uh, <laughs> or came to life, because a lot of people feel like, you know, that that, that was all I did. Well, to, to, so with with that uh, um, gratitude expressed, let me say that uh, 
I graduated from the University of Wyoming, uh, and I was a deputy public defender for, I guess, about eight years before I was assigned the Arias case. I spent probably a couple of years in the um, year and a half, maybe, as a capital defense attorney um, in, in the, with the public defender's office doing exclusively uh, capital cases. Uh, before then, uh, I did uh, a lot of major felony cases, uh, up to and including a lot of major um, sex sex crimes uh, cases. And uh, in terms of cases I'm proud of, I one that comes to mind, there's probably several. I always say, especially in the um, field of sex crimes is that you do not have to commit a sex crime uh, to be accused of a sex crime. I had a uh, young man who was charged with uh, sexual assault. The girl uh, at at issue claimed that uh, she had been uh, too drunk to consent to the sexual behavior, that she drank about a beer and a half and that she blacked out and woke up to my client having uh, sex with her. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, we investigated that claim and found pictures of her on Facebook drinking with her friends uh, back from her hometown. Uh, and uh, my client, and I'm making a, a long story extremely short, uh, the, uh, the reality was that she was ultimately caught in this interlude with her brother and grew up in a strict uh, Christian household and uh, simply made the assertion that uh, she was sexually assaulted. There were no signs of intoxication. She drove home for, uh, well, less than two minutes after she was supposedly passed out at a time when her brother uh, had his car there and could have drove her home, but they each drove their car home. And uh, we went to trial on that case. And I think the pride comes from the fact that in Arizona, someone facing sexual assault charges uh, is looking at uh, mandatory prison time, um, somewhere in the neighborhood of five years, uh, five and a quarter uh, per count, if I'm remembering correctly. And this man was found not guilty and did not have to go to prison uh, based on these allegations. And that's certainly um, just one of several cases, I guess I would say, that uh, I'm proud of in, the, in that realm. Wow. And uh, looking at the uh, evidence in hindsight, do you think that the uh, state overcharged uh, looking back? In terms in terms of the sexual assault uh, case I just talked about? Correct. Yeah. Um, well, certainly. I mean, I think there was, there is a serious issue whether or not the uh, case of sexual assault really, you know, took place or not. Uh, in my mind, and uh, again, you know, but, you know, the cops feel like they have a case. They feel like somebody did this or that, and my client admitted that they had sex, and I guess uh, the prosecutor felt like uh, they had enough to gain a conviction that, that that my guy had actually done this. But they, you know, they needed to look into it a little more. And so, you know, I, I question... Uh, not necessarily being overcharged, but whether he should be charged should have been charged at all. Um, wow. Because this girl's story, this this girl's story, uh, clearly wasn't true. I mean, you know, and ultimately, when you think about our justice system, you know, with the presumption of innocence and the ways that prosecutors are supposed to operate, uh, the goal is not to gain a conviction. The goal is to serve the ends of justice, and you know, that doesn't always happen. And uh, the defense attorneys who face the public scorn are, are the ones that ultimately uh, are the ones de defending that reality, that are fighting for that reality. Because, you know, maybe not to do my own horn, but had he had someone, had this person had someone who was less diligent and did not do those things, uh, he might be in prison right now. And to me, that would not wow. serve, serve the ends of justice. So, um, you know, and so like I say, uh, I, get, I get a lot of fl I get a lot of flack for defending sexual cases. I make no apologies because there's people out there like that, 
And everyone out there is listening and wants to give me flack for taking on cases of this nature. If that was your brother, if that was your father, family you'd want relative, me in your corner. Yeah, you'd want me right. in your corner. Period. As they say, it's very easy to make an accusation. It's very hard to disprove it. Right, and you know, I've I've even uh, had candid, off the record conversations with police officers that will talk to me about, uh, you know, child molest cases, and that is one of the f- most frequent areas where uh, people are falsely accused. Because, as you might be able to conclude there, that um, custody becomes an issue, and if charges of sexual misconduct can be levied against an individual. Uh, without any evidence other than the child being convinced to say this to the police officers, that charges could be leveled. And police will tell me all the time they see people come in, you know, say this, say that, tell them this, tell them that, um, because these allegations can be made and uh, they're obviously very uh, spurious in nature. I've had a, I had a client, I remember uh, trying a case a while back and, and I said, you know, they knew the jury, the prospective jury knew the uh, accusations. And I said, how many how many of you think my client is guilty? And, you know, several hands shot up and said, just look at him. He looks like a pervert. Look what they said he did. Just right there, just off an assertion. And that was another person that I represented that was, in my mind, truly innocent and fortunately uh, was found not guilty. So, um it's just kind of the, the lay of the land in those cases. Absolutely. Now, back to Jody Arias. Uh, you, give me your thoughts on the judge, uh, Judge Stevens. Well, you are just looking to cause ethical problems for me, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, the case is officially over, right? <laughs> well, yes, but again, uh, in Arizona, we have some pretty, pretty strict rules and, uh, you know, that they would they would uh, put me in a position where uh, any comments would be uh, about Judge Stevens would be unwarranted. So, okay, but uh, we we will talk about uh, Mr. Martinez because I do want to play a very interesting clip where I thought he was a little little loud to the witness. You tell me on the other side, sir. Isn't it true that? Uh... On a separate occasion, you actually provided the defendant with a gift. No. Well, sir, do you remember providing her with a book called Erroneous Zones? Yes. And that was something that you provided to her, right? It was mailed to her, yes. Which means you provided it to her, correct? Yes. And you provided it to her because at that point you believed that she was depressed, right? No. Well, let's take a look at what your testimony was. See if this refreshes your memory. And this self-help book talks about positive and practical advice for breaking free from the trap of negative thinking and enjoying life to the fullest, right? Yes, that was for her low self-esteem. It also talks about uh, if you're plagued by guilt or worry and find yourself unwittingly failing, falling into the same old destructive patterns, then Erroneous Zone is the book for you, right? Yes. And you would agree that if you were there to do that, and now you're trying to help her, there seems to be a little bit of the blurring of the lines there. Don't you agree? No, I don't. Well, on the one hand, you want to help her, don't you? By giving her that self-help book. Yes or no? Yes, it wouldn't be bad. Yes, I helped her. And on the other hand, you're to provide an impartial evaluation in this case, right? That's what the code says, right? I didn't read the book to her. I I sent her the book. Right. But you were the one that actually provided it to her so that she could read it, right? Yes, she was unable to get it on her own. I'm not asking whether or not she could get it on her own. The fact that she couldn't get it on her own, that made you upset enough to go out and buy it for her, right? I, no, it didn't make me upset. I did what I did for many people and recommended it. Well, I'm not it. asking about many people. I'm asking about this particular case. Because you said that she couldn't get it, you went out of your way to get it, and then send it to her, right? Correct. That required you to go buy the book, right? Yes. That required you to put it in whatever container there was and mail it to her, right? No, I ordered it online. You ordered it online. Once you received it, it went to her, correct? It was sent directly to her through Amazon. And when you ordered it online, that's with money coming out of your pocket, right? Yes. 
So now not only are you sending her something, you're in a sense 